Beam down smoke. Hello everybody, welcome back to another video. My name is Nalo and today we're gonna to be talking about high tier trading. So high tier trading is a very weird world if you've never been part of it before. And uh, there's a lot of things that you need to learn in order to really navigate the high tier landscape the best you possibly can. So basically this video is going to aim to help you guys figure out how to do high tier trading in CSGO and how to get better at it and all the information that you'll have to know in terms of terminology and things like that. Also, one quick little point before we get started with the video, guys. I'm not going to give you specific price points on everything because that would take way too long. I'm going to try and give you general price points on everything, though, and how much overpay certain things add, and uh, that's going to be pretty much the whole video. So thank you guys for watching this, and let's get started. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to touch on on high tier trading, one of the big terminologies is corners and spines. So corners refers to karambits mostly. There's not really anything else that has a specific corner that people actually overpay for, but on karambits, corners are very, very important in terms of the high tier skins. So like on Fade Knives and Tiger Tooths especially, corners are very important and they can add a lot of value to your knife if they're good. So corners can really be any sort of tier or any level depending on the float. The float doesn't really matter too much. You could really, you could have a double zero float that still has a bad corner. And so you gotta make sure that you are looking at the corner and not necessarily the float. Although in some cases the float does impact the value. Also in lower tier Karambit skins such as the Damascus Steel for example, those corners don't really matter too much. It's mostly going to be on the higher tier ones like Dopplers, Fades, etc. So we're going to go ahead and start off. There's three different tiers of corners that will actually add overpay. The first one is going to be a flawless corner. Now the flawless corner is the absolute highest tier one. That's the one that everybody wants to get. They're also extremely rare. The flawless corners are going to have absolutely no scratches on them whatsoever. They look absolutely perfect. There's not a single blemish on it whatsoever. Uh, and then next we have the pixel corner, which is essentially as close to a flawless corner as you can get without actually being flawless. It's going to have like one pixel removed on the actual skin. And uh, so it's going to be very, very close to flawless, but not quite flawless. And that one will also add overpay. And then the next one is BTA. BTA essentially just refers to better than average. And you're going to hear that a lot if you do high tier trading on different skins. But on the Karamit corner, better than average essentially just means that it's not super scratched up and it just has a little bit taken out of the corner overall. As for how much value the overpay actually adds to these skins, on the flawless corners you're going to see around $200 USD on the really high tier skins uh, for a flawless corner. People like to overpay quite a bit for those because, you know, they're pretty much absolutely perfect. Uh, next up we have the pixel corners and those ones are going to add around $50 to $150 depending on how good it actually is. And uh, those ones obviously you're going to pay a little bit less but you're going to have a little bit of a less corner as well again corner very important on the karambits and then for the bta corners those ones can range anywhere from like 20 bucks to like 100 bucks on the very bta ones and uh, those ones of course depend on how much the seller is actually selling it for and uh, those ones you're going to have to overpay for just because they are better than average as you can tell by the name and of course these are not very specific price points clearly this is just a general price point uh, guide for these corners if you look at something like a really high tier stat trek blue gem knife that one if it had a corner a really good one then it would be worth more than it would regularly be worth on like a Kramit fade for example just because these knives all are different and all of the skins are different so it's kind of just a general price guide and don't take it to heart it's going to depend on the knife now moving on and still speaking of karambits we next have fade percentage so fade percentage refers to specifically fade not marble fade just specifically fade so fade percentage can happen on pretty much any knife in the game that has a fade skin and it does determine value quite a bit as well for example, a Karambit Fade with 100% Fade is going to go for around 1200 USD to maybe even up to 1400 USD if the knife is really good. And take that in comparison to one with like Market Value Fade, which is only going to be worth around $800 and usually is around 80 to 90% Fade. So obviously Fade Percentage can really affect the value of your knife. It doesn't affect the lower tier knives like the Falchions, for example. It doesn't affect those ones as much, but does still affect the value. And uh, we're going to kind of break down how Fade Percentage works now. So on Karambits, for example, Fade Percentage percentage depends on how much yellow is actually shown and how little purple is shown. So on the higher tier, uh, higher level fade percentages like 95 to 100% fade percentage, those ones are going to have more yellow and less purple and they're going to fade a lot better throughout the entire knife. The ones with lower percentage of fade, for example the ones with around 85% fade, are going to just basically have purple and pink and no yellow on the skin at all. And then if you take, for example, my knife, which is a 94% fade, that one's going to have a nice little fade distribution of a little bit of yellow, a decent amount of purple, and a lot of pink. 
There's also the very rare fade pattern that's only on Karamich really, that is a 90-10 pattern. This one's going to have 90% pink and 10% yellow. These ones are very cool looking and are the most desirable Karambit fade pattern, and they pretty much only exist on the Karambit fades. There is an argument for the Talon fade also having a 90-10 pattern, but it's not really, you know, established too much in reality like the Karambit fade actually is. So this one, of course, looks very cool and is worth a ton of overpay. There's also fake 90-10 patterns, but most of the time people tend to stick to the real true 90-10 patterns when they're buying a Karambit Fade. There's also a lot of weird unique patterns on the Karambit Fade, like the 90-3-7, but that one isn't really important to mention. Anything that's not really a 90-10 is going to pretty much go for a pretty solid value of market price but anything that has really good fade distribution, like 94%, is obviously going to gain more value just because of its fade percentage, and not necessarily if it's a 90-10 or whatever. But on the really high tier ones, the 90-10s with a good 100% fade, that one is going to be a true 90-10 and is going to garner a lot of overpay. Those tend to go for almost $400 overpay, if not even more in some cases. As for the fade percentage breakdown, you have anything that's around 95 to 90% in that area that tends to go for about $100 to $200 overpay, if not a little bit more. The ones that are under 90% fade are all pretty much market price, and then the ones that are like 95 to 100% tend to go for maybe 200 to 250, maybe even 300 in some cases. And of course, if it's a 90-10, a lot more. So now that that's taken care of, let's talk about tips and spines. So spines are going to refer to bayonets mostly and gut knives. Those ones are going to be anything that has a thick spine. The crambit obviously doesn't have a thick spine. It's very thin on the edges. But on the gut knife, the bayonet, the M9 bayonet, for example, those ones do have pretty clear spines on them. They're kind of thicker in 3D, I guess I could, you could call them. And on those ones, the spine is going to be very, very important because the spine refers to, you know, how much wear is actually going to occur on the back of that knife in that area. And then for the tips on most of these knives, it's also going to occur on the bayonets and the M9 bayonets and any of the linear sort of like straight knives like the Huntsman, for example, again, those tips are going to refer to marble fades only, not uh, regular fades. Marble fades are going to be uh, mostly red tips that are going to be the most desirable ones. On the Huntsman, for example, a red tip Huntsman marble fade is going to be worth about 15 keys over market price in that kind of area, and uh, a lot of these can garner more if they are in that good pattern. M9 bayonet with a blue tip or a red tip, again, also gains quite a bit over market, and uh, that's kind of what you have to look at when you're looking at those straighter knives not the ones like the Karim, for example. So speaking of marble fades, we also have something called maxes. So maxes are going to occur specifically on like the fire and ice knives. So with the Karim marble fade fire and ice, you're going to have a first max, second max, third max, fourth max, etc. And all of these maxes as they go all the way down are going to decrease in price and they all look very different. So here's a few pictures of maxes. There's a first max, of course, right here. And then there's something like a fourth max right here. And then there's, of course, something like a 10th max here. There's also fake fire and ices, and for example, this is a fake fire and ice where there is going to be some yellow on the tip there. These ones don't go for as much as the real true fire and ices with good maxes, and keep that in mind as well. Now as for pricing on this, it's going to be way too hard to go into specifications because of all the maxes, but I can tell you on the first max, like a true fire and ice with a really good corner and a really good float and all that kind of thing, those ones can go all the way up to even $2,000 if not more, and uh, you know, those, those can get very, very expensive. So I'd just stick to the fake fire and ice ones if I were you, I wouldn't really spend that much on them but you would have a very rare knife in that case. There's also bayonet, M9 bayonet, and flip marble fade fire and ices, and I'm going to go ahead and show you those now. So the bayonet marble fade is going to have a first max that looks something like this, and then there's going to be a final max or a last max or a tenth max, whatever they considered. I believe it's a rank 25 on the bayonet fire and ice, and that one's going to look something like this. As for the flip knife, that one is going to have a first max that looks like this, and then a max fake max, which is going to look something like this. And then on the M gut knife marble fade, you're going to have a first max that looks like this, and then finally a final max that looks like this. These all have very specific price points as well, and very specific maxes, but on the bayonet, you're going to see pretty hefty price on those. The first maxes I've seen can even go up to the 700 to 1000 range in some cases. The ones for the flip knife can go up to like the 500, 600, 700 range in some cases, and then the gut knives can actually go up to around the 300 to 400 dollar range, maybe less than that, and it obviously depends on how desirable the fire and ice pattern is at the time. So now I'm going to briefly explain Doppler knives because I don't want to make this video go on for too long. So Dopplers are going to have four main phases, regular Dopplers of course, those ones are going to have phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. Phase one is going to have a lot of black and a little bit of pink. 
Phase 2 is going to have a lot of pink and a little bit of black. Phase 3 is going to have some green in it for some reason, and blue and black. And then finally, Phase 4 is going to have blue and some black. And that one's going to be just for the Doppler Knives. For the Game of Doppler Knives, those ones also have Phase 1, 2, 3, and 4. Phase 1 has a lot of black, some green. Phase 2 has a lot of green and pretty much no black. Phase 3 has some cyan, green, and lime, and black, and then Phase 4 has lime and blue mostly. And those ones are going to look very nice in all of their own respective senses. They'll look very good and uh, are fairly cheap in terms of the regular phases. As for the Doppler gems, those ones are going to be emeralds, sapphires, and rubies. So for the sapphire knives, you're going to have obviously a full blue knife, the rubies are going to have a full red knife, and the emeralds are going to have a full green knife. There's also black pearls, which are going to be mostly a black, kind of a blue, kind of pink little vibe on them. It tends to be that people enjoy the gem knives more than they like the black pearl knives. The black pearls are a 1 in 100 chance, and the gem knives are a 1 in 10 chance, so it's a little bit weird, but people do like them better just because they look a lot better than the black pearls do. The gem knives are going to range around $1,000 for like a flip and bowie and huntsman, and then for the... Uh, lower tier ones like the gut, those ones are about 400 to 500. And then as for the emeralds, those ones are going to be a lot more expensive. The guts can be up at like 600. The flips can be up at like 1.5k roughly in that kind of area. And then for the really high tier knives, the the emeralds can go all the way up to like $6,000 on a really, really nice uh, karambit. And then on the lower tier ones, those emeralds, of course, a lot less. And then for the black pearls, those ones can go up very, very expensive as well. The crambit uh, black pearls are very rare. There's barely even 100 of them in existence, uh, maybe even less than that. And those ones can go for up to like 5.6k in some cases, if not more. Very expensive knives and very good looking knives as well. Now we're going to move on to high tier sticker trading. So this is going to reference the Kato 14 and Kato 15 stickers mostly because those are the ones that are most popularly traded right now. But I'll also reference some of the high tier foils like the Crown Foil and the Howling Dawn. That's a normal sticker, not a foil, but you know, you get the point. So let's talk about the Kato 14 and Kato 15s. So if you want a full gun in Kato 14s, I actually made one a while back. So go watch that video. There's going to be a card up top for that video and I'll also, you know, have it on screen so you guys know what to look for. And that's going to be pretty much everything you need to know about Kato VC 2014 stickered weapons. Well, then as for Katowice 2015, those ones are a little bit different. Those ones actually go for higher sticker percentages in general. In some cases, you can get up to 10%, 15%, even 20% for a single Kato 15 sticker on some guns. This is because they do hold lower values than the Kato 14s, but they are pretty desirable, and in some cases, more desirable than the Kato 14s. So those ones can get a higher sticker percentage. As for the crown foils, those ones can go up to 15 to 25% sticker percentage depending on the gun, and then as for the Howling Dons, those ones can also similarly get about a 10-25% to 25 sticker percentage um, based on the gun. It's also important to realize that the more stickers on a gun, the more value it's going to have in terms of sticker percentage. So basically on the ones that have like 4 times, you can get up to 50% sticker percentage. Um, for the ones that have like 3 times, those ones generally are around like maybe 20%, 25% sticker percentage, and then the ones that are lower end are going to be around 15, you know, 10, 1% sticker percentage in some cases for the Kato 14s and so those ones obviously you have to look into on a specific gun by gun basis you can't really just take this video and generalize it and uh, say that that's what's going to happen for every single gun it does depend on what the person's selling it for but that's generally a good price guide to go by Generally though, what you should look for in terms of how you should invest in stickers and how you should trade for stickers, you should really just look for the ones that are over $50. Those are the only ones you're really going to get to see a lot of overpay for or are going to have to overpay for. Sticker position also matters quite a lot. On AKs, for example, the best sticker position is on the wood. On ops, for example, the best sticker position is on the scope. And for other guns, it depends, of course, but it's usually hotly argued on the ones that aren't ops or AKs. The better that the sticker is placed, the more value the sticker is actually worth. And now that I very quickly and very briefly explained stickers, we're going to move on to floats and try to briefly explain that as well. So floats are going to be a pretty complicated thing in general, so there's going to be a sort of breakdown on how you're going to get overpay for floats. On knives that don't tend to have very low floats, those ones with the double zero floats or the triple zero floats, you're going to see a lot of overpay for. The ones that are pretty common to see double zero floats on, some of the Doppler knives for example, are pretty common to see double zero floats on. Uh, for those ones, you're going to not get any overpay for because it is obviously a common occurrence. For the ones that have very high floats, like 0.99 for example, you have something like a Blackamov. And a Blackamov op that's a 0.99 float, that one can get up to like $400, if not more. Those can go very, very expensive these days. And then for ones like a 0.97, I actually had a 0.97 Blackamov recently. I sold that for around $250, and that's generally what their market price is. And it, of course, depends specifically on the float. 
uh, for those black moths and also on the scope so if the scope has some white on it it's not going to get as much overpay but for the ones that have a full black scope like mine did those ones do get more overpay Basically what it comes down to is very high float and very low float skins. So for example, on the Safari Mesh, that one caps out at 0.8. So I saw a 0.799999, for example, going for around 10 Arcanas, which is about $300. So pretty crazy prices for some of these really high float skins. And of course it depends on the skin again. Uh, it doesn't, you know, for the ones that have very high floats, those ones are going to get a lot of overpay. And for the ones with very low floats, those are going to get overpay as well. But again, depends on the skin. So you have to do that on a skin by skin basis. That's just a general guide to them. Also extremely low floats like quintuple zero floats can go for a crazy amount of money. For example, a Doppler Ruby with a quintuple zero float recently got unboxed and that's going to just go for an astronomically high amount of money. So speaking of floats, there's also another thing with USP Orion specifically and USPs in general. So there's something on the USP called the duct. It's essentially like a corner on a karambit. So the duct is going to be this little thing in the middle here that I'm pointing out. And this is going to be a very important thing to look for, especially on USP Orions when you're valuing them. So if a USP, especially USP Orion, has a very clean duct, it's going to be worth a lot more than something with a bad duct. Remember when I said earlier in the video that BTA is going to occur a lot in high tier trading? Well, BTA or better than average also can refer to ducts. So when it comes to ducts, you can have a better than average duct that looks very, very clean, that has barely any scratches on it whatsoever, and that's going to get a lot of overpay. In general, flawless ducts can get all the way up to $100 overpay on the USP Orions, and it of course depends on the buyer. Those ones are a little bit more of a collector item, and those ones are going to kind of be on a buyer basis. Also, aside from the USP Orion, there are a few more very clean, very low float items that you should be aware of. For example, on the Asimov skins, low floats are very important because it means that the look very clean in game. The M4 Asimov, the ones that are about 0.26 and lower, are going to get overpay. I have a 0.25 Asimov, for example, and that one gets about $10 to $15 overpay just on CS money alone. The ones that are even lower than that can go for astronomical prices. The 0.18 M4 Asimovs in stat track can go all the way up to like $1,500, an absolutely astronomical value because 0.18 is the lowest float you can get on an M4 Asimov. Op Asimovs with very low floats are also similarly very expensive, and those ones should be looked out for as well when you're searching for nice skins. Low float hydroponics are also a very interesting and rare skin to find, and the low float hydroponics also garner quite a bit of overpay because, again, they look very clean with low floats. As for high float skins, I mentioned before the uh, Op Blackamov, for example, is a very high float skin that gets a lot of overpay, and for other high float skins, there also exists stuff like the high float safari meshes that get a lot of overpay, the Op Safari meshes, and then of course there's also high float skins like the Op Hyper Beast and very high float because that one kind of conforms around the dragon on the Op Hyper Beast, and that's why it gets so much overpay. And that's basically all the high and low float skins that you should be looking out for when you're coming to high tier trading. And then next one, what I want to talk about is some more rare stickers that a lot of people tend to overlook. These include the Harp of War Hollow, the King on the Field uh, Wriggler sticker Normal, and the Howling Dawn, and the Wing Diffuser. So these are all worth quite a bit of money, and they do also add sticker percentage to each gun they're put on. However, they aren't as desired as something like a Crown Foil, so they don't get that much overpay on the gun. They do get some, though. Out of the ones I mentioned, the King on the Field is actually the rarest out of all of those in terms of regular unapplied stickers, so if you can get a King on the Field, definitely go for those, those are super super rare, and not very desirable, but again, super super rare. Now I also wanted to talk about Case Hardens in this video, but those are a little bit too expansive of a topic, so I'm going to save those for another video. I'm also going to be talking about Souvenir Cato 14s and general other souvenirs like the All-Star Souvenirs, and that's going to be in another video as well. So I'm sorry for not covering that in this video, but again, it would be way too long if I did that, so that's going to be saved for another video. We're already reaching about 20 minutes on this video, which is absolutely crazy. One of the longest videos I've made in a long time, but hopefully it includes all of the information you need to know to navigate the high tier trading scene. So with that being said, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I hope you all learned something from this video. Hopefully this is a good resource for people going out there into the high tier trading world and figuring everything out. And hopefully this summed up the information faster than you would have read it on some guides online, for example. And thank you all for watching so much. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and go join the Discord server. We're about to hit 800 members on the Discord server, which is absolutely insane. And of course, be sure to follow me on Twitter if you want more in-depth daily updates on what I do in CSGO. So thank you guys so much for that, and I'll see you all next time. Peace.